Mr. Greg Tavine has spent much of his life believing he can create the community you want to live in. While in college, he co-founded Students Today, Leaders Forever, and the Pay It Forward Tour. Since, its 2000, since 2003, it has sent out over 28,000 students to serve over 400,000 hours of service. Among his many impressive uh, points in his bio, he co-founded Emerging Prairie, an organization dedicated to connecting and celebrating the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the Midwest. He teaches as an adjunct pr professor at Concordia College on social entrepreneurship in Bangalore, India. How exciting is that? <laughs> Greg's current activities include co-organizing One Million Cups Fargo, Startup Weekend Fargo, and curating TEDx Fargo. He has been published on Forbes.com, TED.com, and various other publications and give, has given keynotes across the country. He's originally from West Fargo, North Dakota, so welcome to the South. We, were, we worked really hard to make sure we gave you a lot of sun and our wonderful humidity that Arkansas has to offer for you. He earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota. He completed an executive education course on social entrepreneurship from Stanford's Graduate School of Business. Let's give a warm wel welcome to Mr. Greg Tavine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you all for having me, and thank you, Marty. I did want to announce, um, Marty has agreed her bank will give everyone no interest uh, loans for the rest of the year, so if you just talk to her, she'd love to do that. Um, so, so yeah, well, it's an honor to be here. I'm a fifth-generation North Dakotan, and this is my first time in Arkansas. I, uh, I actually refuse to fly anything but Delta. I love Delta, and so I got to take three flights here. How many of you ever had to take three flights within the U.S.? Um, uh, but I had a pretty special moment this morning when I realized I feel very connected to the University of Arkansas Little Rock. And as somebody from North Dakota, you might be like, why? Well, um, I, um, I recently got engaged. And so my wife, well, no, she's not my wife, uh, but we decided it would be a really good idea to go to see the March Madness basketball games in Denver this year. And we're like, hey, our dads don't know each other. They love each other, or they love basketball. So we thought it'd be a good idea to take a dad's trip um, before we got married so they could get to know, uh, know each other. And we realized really quickly that was a really bad idea um, because they said yes and we went to Denver. And so we flew our dads in awkwardly and they got to hang out and they used an Airbnb for the first time. And uh, what was interesting is we went to the first round games and the University of Arkansas Little Rock was there. And I love the underdog. So with four minutes to go, uh, down 15, the University of Arkansas Little Rock gave me that shining moment where we like scooted up, went up to the front row, cheered them on until they won. How many of you were watching that game? That was awesome. So I got to see it in person. That was the highlight of the trip. The dads eventually got together, but sitting with your future father-in-law and my own dad for three days watching basketball, maybe not a good idea. We're not gonna do the dad's trip again. Uh, but, but anyways, that's my connection with the University of Little Rock, Arkansas. So uh, today I wanna tell you some stories. I'm a fifth generation North Dakotan. And before you say like, oh, that's so, I'm so sorry. No, it's a good thing. I love where I'm from. Uh, how many of you are multi-generation folks from Arkansas? Uh, fantastic. How many of you grew up here? All right, how many of you are like, holy cow, I live in Arkansas. I never thought I would do that. Um, <laughs> how, how, how many of you live in communities of 250,000 people or less? And how many of you have ever been talked louder, or speak, people speak louder to you or slower because of where you're from? Um, well, that's me too. And so um, what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about how I believe that we really can create the community we want to live in. Um, I'm 31 years old, halfway to 62, um, and when I was a kid, Pluto was still a planet. And, uh, um, and, and when I was a kid, um, I was told, you, you know, I was from that generation where our mom sent us to, to soccer practice with a note, like, you're the best, we got participation medals for everything we did. Um, and, and I was also um, what, what is now described as a millennial. So I'm of the elders of the millennials. So I, I kind of have that perspective of an elder within a, a group of people that are kind of interesting. So today, what I want to do is just share my experience. Share my experience growing up in a rural community. Uh, show, share my experience of what we've done to make Fargo a pretty interesting and exciting place. And hopefully you can transfer this back home. Hopefully you can take some of these ideas, try them on. And if nothing else, hopefully I'm slightly awkward enough that you'll laugh once in a while. 
Um, so I want to bring you back to 1987, okay? So this was an exciting time in North Dakota. We were still the only state in the United States of America with a dec declining population. Uh, so that was our claim to, flame, uh, claim to fame. Uh, the state was declining, and they, they, they went to the academics, the smart people. How many of you know these like smart academics? Maybe we'll just look at them in the room. Are there any here? Uh, and they said, what do we do with North Dakota? And these folks at Princeton said, with the kindly population, the best thing to do with North Dakota is to give the state back to its original roots, and they created the, uh, the Buffalo Commons. Um, where they thought it would be fantastic if the buffalo could continue to roam across North Dakota. And that's how I grew up, is thinking the best thing for my home state was to give it back to the buffalo. The other thing that was happening in 1987 was the brain drain. Did, did Arkansas go through this, the brain drain, where they said all the best and brightest need to leave? And so I was like, well, I'm kind of smart. I should probably leave too then. Uh, and that was kind of the message. And so with the buffalo commons and the brain drain, all the politicians were talking how the state was declining. And as a young person growing up in that environment, I couldn't wait to leave. Um, and, and so when I was a person in this space, um, I started thinking I was going to go to the best school I could. I went to the University of Minnesota as fast as I could. And when I got to the University of Minnesota, imagine a fifth generation North Dakotan, very white, with an afro um, going to school in an urban environment. That didn't go over so well. Uh, and then I would say, hey, I'm from Fargo. And, and people will be like, oh my gosh, like the movie. I'm like, oh yes, how many of you have seen the movie? How many of you have seen the TV show? Yeah, like fantastic. Or they're like, oh, Wells Fargo, I love the bank. I'm like, oh, that's great. Um, and, then, and then generally it would always come back to Mount Rushmore. I'm like, sweet, South Dakota. Um, and so I was always kind of laughed at from where I was from. And, and I realized like it's geographical bullying, right? I mean, people are making fun of you from where you're from. And so, like, my whole life, Fargo, we've just been laughed at, right? Like, literally, I was in Montana skiing in March, and at the, at the airport, I said to the guy, hey, I'm, I'm going home to Fargo, I'm really excited. He's like, what do you even do there? Or, do you still live in teepees? I remember, like, 2010, somebody asked, do you have the internet? It's like, yes, you know, like, everyone does. Um, but but that's, what, that's kind of the perception of Fargo. But that's not the Fargo I know. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I love my community, it's fantastic. But I realized geographical bullying is happening elsewhere. When I was in Topeka, Kansas, they're like, oh, sweet, Wizard of Oz, right? People literally ask folks there, do you wear ruby red slippers? And no, that's not true. Topeka is a fascinating urban environment. Or you think about Wisconsin, like the cheese heads. How many of you, do you, do you know any cheese head friends? Uh, but Wisconsin is fascinating, right? Appleton, Wisconsin, this community um, was uh, uh, completely in a struggle of gaining young people and an incredible musician from their hometown created the Mile of Music Festival, where over a four-day period, uh, they get hundreds of musicians to perform in coffee shops, restaurants on their campus, and they celebrate all Wisconsin music. And now Appleton is known as the music capital of Wisconsin, and they're redefining that they're not just football fans. I think about uh, the slums, right? How many of you have ever seen Slumdog Millionaire? Um, when people think about India, you might have a perception of a slum or folks that are living in poverty. It's a country of over one billion people. I know India as a place that's vibrant and energetic. Bangalore, India has incredible food and technology. And so I, as I think about all this, I really believe geographical bullying needs to stop. And if I poke fun at somebody because of their gender, their sexuality, their race, we know that's wrong. But why is it my mom, who's from rural North Dakota, a valid Victorian, incredibly smart woman, when I've traveled with her, people always talk louder to her when she says she's from North Dakota? <laughs> you, you laugh, but it's real. And it hurts. And I think the geographical bullying needs to stop. So if you want to join my campaign, we'll be working on that later, maybe, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but what I want to talk about is creating the community you want to be part of. And I got five community ideas that I want to share with you that have worked in Fargo, where I think we have redefined our community's brand. We've redefined how young people interact in our community, and we've redefined what leadership looks like. So the first is to educate your city. Um, I I'd imagine so many folks connected to the extension service, you would identify with this, but learning doesn't just happen in a classroom, and learning doesn't just happen K through 12, K through 16. Learning is a lifetime practice. Think about the, um, the adoption of the internet and how things are changing, or social media, or even virtual reality and artificial intelligence. How do, we, how do we keep up with all this activity? Think about banking, right? 
blockchain. How many of you are paying attention to alternative currencies, Bitcoin, these types of things? Like learning doesn't just happen in a university and then we're done. It's a continual process. So our work is a cornerstone of it is to educate our city. So how do we do that? Uh, first thing is we think ideas matter. How many of you ever watched TED Talks? So TED Talks were created in the 80s. In uh, 2003, uh, they, TED was put online for free. And since then, over 1 billion talks have been viewed online for free. Ideas were spreading, six to 18 minute videos. So it turns out TED has the ability to have a license where you can use their brand and you can create a local event. And so these have happened in 10,000 communities around the world. Uh, and they happen in interesting places. In the Middle East, there will be uh, TED Talks where they work with folks from different cultures and, and they have the events. They've done TED Talks uh, in Madrid, Spain, in a prison where they, they give inmates the opportunity to, to share their ideas with community members. It's this incredible way. And in Fargo, it's made a really, really big impact. And what I mean by that is we started out with our first event in 2012. And we said, okay, let's get four different ideas um, to be shared. We, we put together a little committee and we were all young people. Nobody knew who we were. And we said, let's get an artist, a doctor, a farmer, and an entrepreneur to speak. And we're like, let's do this event differently. Let's have it in a unique space. So we had it in an art gallery. We had incredible local craft beer. We had fantastic food. How many of you have been to a boring conference with boring food? Like, I don't want to go to that conference anymore. And so we're like, let's do it differently. And so we crammed 100 people into this room and we focused on bringing decision makers. So we brought educators, artists, entrepreneurs, executives, and philanthropists. And so we pre-sold 90 tickets and then we opened up our tickets for TEDx Fargo and we sold out in 10 minutes. Um, and people are like, wow, that's fantastic. But nobody asked how many tickets we sold, it was like four. Um, so we find that like, if you sell out, that's really good branding. Um, and this guy, this was one of our first speakers, Doug Burgum. He built a little software company in the 80s called Great Plains Software. Well, luckily it grew to 2,000 people. He sold to Microsoft in 2001. And uh, he's going to become our next governor. But what our community got to meet him in 2012 when he was sharing his idea of curiosity and the value of asking great questions. The little event grew, so we ended up having 600 people at the Fargo Theater for our fourth year. Uh, and then we started to say, how can we bring our guests and interact in our community? So we started doing downtown walking tours where we could look at the historical part of our community with an architect. Or doing rooftop yoga before, uh, before things kicked off. We started to create adventures, like, which are like code for adult field trip, um, where people would, uh, would go on cooking classes. Uh, or we brought in the 2013 uh, mixologist of the year, the guy that wrote the cocktail book that was best cocktail book, and did that before the event. And that was a really bad idea because if you go practice making cocktails before a conference, you're intoxicated, and an hour into the thing, it didn't, they, didn't, they didn't stay. But, uh, but we created all this energy and activity. And last year, we had, um, we had our breaks designed so it wasn't just about the bathrooms. It was about mingling and meeting people. And we had ambassadors in the crowd that were introducing people and helping them discuss these ideas shared on the stage. And last year, we had 1,800 people at TEDx Fargo. And it was, it was phenomenal. And it was planned by these people. There was no titles on the team. The superintendent of the public schools was on the same team as the high school senior. The doctor was on the same team as the college medical student. Artists, students, we found this incredible collaboration of people to celebrate our community. Uh, TEDx Fargo will take place uh, in two weeks time. Uh, and we'll have over 2,000 people coming to Fargo. And these are New York Times bestselling authors, artists, scientists. And it's really about bringing people together for ideas. This can happen in any size community. This can happen in bigger communities. This can happen in smaller communities. This is an incredible tool that you could bring to your community. And guess what? Young people love it. And we found that getting young people really key leadership roles made it so they were more likely to stay. Out of our original planning team of 12 people, nine of us run our own companies now. Three of them told me, one of our speakers, one of our volunteers, and one of the audience members said, you know what, Greg, I was going to move in two weeks. I'm going to stay now because of this. It gave people an opportunity to contribute to our community. So a lot of fun. Uh, another thing that's interesting, how many of you have friends that are venture capitalists? Uh, okay, not, that's fantastic. You're lucky. So venture capitalists, people that pour money into supporting entrepreneurs, and often they get a bad rap. 
Well, in our community, there's a venture capital firm called Arthur Ventures, um, and they, they invest all over the world. And, and they say, hey, we want to do our learning and development, not just for our entrepreneurs and our staff, but when we get high profile people in our community, we want them to speak. So this is their first event that they hosted. On the left is Rich Carlgaard, the publisher of Forbes. On the right is Mike Cannon Brooks. He's a college dropout from Sydney, Australia. He built a company called Atlassian. It just IPO'd in, in uh, last fall, and it, they're probably worth $6 billion. So they, they bring these guys in to speak about entrepreneurship and possibilities. But what Arthur Ventures did that I believe is so fascinating is they invited middle school kids. And they invited our community, oh, I took a photo. They brought our community in, and 800 people came to a free event. And I think as communities, when we get high profile people to come into our communities, we need to think, who needs to hear this message? And it's not always who can afford to pay for the message. And so when all of us that have great social capital and resources, how do we share these opportunities like Arthur Ventures did? They've done it for three years now. And they bring in high profile speakers and they throw a community event where they give it to the community for free to say learn. Because they want to create the community where everyone learns about entrepreneurship, where everyone has an opportunity to, to have the best access to information. It's made a really big difference. Another thing I think about is how do we stack events? So I get paid to go speak around the country. And one thing I wish is that, the, that people would say, hey, Greg, I've got some friends. You have to meet them. So when we bring our speakers in, this is Clay, uh, Clay Hebert. Uh, he's one of the thought leaders in the world on, on crowdfunding. So he came in to speak at one of our events in our community. And the morning before, we organized a bunch of nonprofits and people that wanted to use crowdfunding. And we had them do an hour-long free session Q&A just to get him plugged in. Before TEDx Fargo in two weeks, we'll have 20 events with all of our speakers where they're meeting with our mayor in his community. They're meeting with our university president with these private meetings. And we find that's a way that we can maximize a speaker's time. And I think for all of us, especially in rural America, uh, when we get people to come in, how do we maximize their time? And so that's one thing we always think about is how do we stack events? Big thing I believe in is infuse the arts. How many arts enthusiasts are here? So my greatest frustration, next to geographical bullying, um, is definitely this idea that we ask artists to do things for free, and then we promise them exposure. How many of you know somebody that's done this? So that frustrates the hell out of me, and I know I'm swearing, uh, but what makes me so mad is if we want to value the artists, and I believe artists drive culture, and I believe artists give us a glimpse into the world, we need to spend real money with them and spend it fast. If you want to support the arts, yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's like great to support the arts, like organizations, but buy a concert ticket, buy a painting, support the work directly, and figure out ways to and bring the arts into everything you do. That's my challenge for you. So we said, hey, it was like I was very single. Uh, you know, community development happens a lot when you're really single because you're like looking for ladies, or I was. And um, so, anyways, um, we said, hey, who wants to have dinner at midnight? I posted it on Facebook. A couple said, I'll do it, I'll do it. So we created this thing called Midnight Brunch. And what we did is we had an artist design one table. Um, we had the best cocktails at uh, 10 p.m. We had incredible food at midnight, or at 11, which was all vegan friendly, all gluten free friendly. How many of you have friends with food allergies or limitations? Why is it that they always have to ask, can I do it without meat? Um, I just think about that, like why not make it easy for people that have food limitations so they can feel welcome? Anyway, so we have great food and then a toast at midnight. And what we found is we did it on a Thursday because we're like, we need a shared uh, experience and Friday we'll just be miserable together. And, and people actually showed up. Um, they came and it was dentists and lawyers. It was all these folks. We charged them like 50 bucks, we spent all the money. And what was interesting is two type of people started to show up at about 11 o'clock on these nights. Executives and college kids. I was like, if college kids are sneaking into my parties, that is a good sign, right? Um, and relationships started to form. So we've done 13 of these midnight brunches. And what's been interesting is relationships form. People want to come. And the media covers it. Condé Nast Traveler did a piece on it. And CNN did a piece on it. But it wasn't about a fundraiser, and it wasn't about building an organization. It was just friends that infused the arts. We brought, in, uh, we brought in the ballet to do a piece. We brought in the symphony to do a surprise piece during the brunch. And all those folks got invited to go to the symphony two days later. 
And 30 of the 50 people that came to that midnight brunch showed up for the symphony, many of which was the very first time. And it was a way for us to infuse the arts with a unique experience. Another project that some friends did I think is fantastic. How many have gross alleys in your community? You know, the ones with the dumpsters and the cigarette butts. The, these folks said, hey, let's beautify our alleys. And so what they did is they hired an artist to do watercolor all over, the, um, uh, all over the sidewalk. They brought in greenery. They brought in a market. They brought in a band. Uh, they brought in hula hoop contests, which I kicked that little kid's butt. Uh, and, and what was interesting is they had this incredible experience where they reimagined our alleys. And it was done by these guys, high school and college kids. They didn't have all the permits they needed, and they believed in asking for forgiveness versus permission, which gratefully they were given that forgiveness. Um, they broke a bunch of code, but they got people excited about our alleys. Now more businesses are showing up in the alleys. Photos are being shared from those events. These digital assets are making people think about our community. There's been four alley fairs in the Midwest since then because of their work. And they position themselves as thought leaders. How do we reimagine underutilized spaces to give people an experience that they want to be part of? Next one I think about, how many of you have read uh, uh, The Great Gatsby? Well, I'm honored to say that James Gatsby from The Gates, Great Gatsby is the 14th wealthiest fictional character of all time, according to Forbes. And he's from North Dakota. So I think that is awesome. So when his movie was coming out, we we're like, let's throw a huge party. And at that time, like, I was too old to go to the college parties. I couldn't afford to go to the philanthropy events. And I was like, let's just throw a, an amazing party. So um, we said, hey, let's do a welcome home James Gatsby party. They, we did the green light, because I think my English teacher said something about the green light represents hope, right? You're with me on that? So we thought that we were applying knowledge from high school. And all these people dressed up. We charged 100 bucks to be there. Um, and, and these people came, and they had fun. And most of the people that came were new to Fargo. They weren't the people that had lived there forever. They were the new people like, wow, this city is great. They throw parties just because and nobody asked me for more money. How many of you would like to go to a great party where at the end they don't ask you for more money? I do, okay? Um, and so we're like, cool, let's do another one. Parties through time. Mad Men was huge. So we convinced the newspaper to let us use their old school office building to throw a party. Uh, people dressed up. We brought in a burlesque dancer. That didn't go so well because they didn't tell the night shift that we were doing that. And that led to some emails. We had an open tab on booze. Um, 100 people drink on average 8.5 cocktails. Uh, and that cost me thousands of dollars, uh, which was not good. But what was good is a community starting to form. And people had a fun experience. And they took photos and they shared them. And it started to reposition our community. Another project of infusing the arts can be about architecture and design. So one of our friends, Joe, said, I'm going to create the greatest sauna. So you probably don't need saunas and heat in the winter like we do. Um, but when is cold here? I'm just curious. Like 30? OK, cool. So that's like, like, that's like the best day of the year for us in winter. Uh, they created this mobile sauna. And they had it beautifully designed by architects. And they brought it to events. And community started to form around this, uh, this sauna. This sauna is a mobile sauna. It's been featured in the Washington Post. It's been featured in a bunch of publications. But their commitment to design was special. And in all of our work, when we bring the artists in, it brings energy. It brings a freshness. It brings a perspective. And guess what? The artists love it. Co-working is a huge concept right now. How many of you have co-working spaces in your community? How many of you have people in your community that want a co-working space, maker space? So we, we open up a co-working space. And instead of um, going the traditional route, we had artists design our conference room. So we have two conference rooms. We, we had them both designed by artists. And I walked in the first day to one of them, and it was all graffitied, like complete graffiti. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Well, who's going to use this? I didn't understand it. And I was like, this is bad news. Well, all the graffiti was inspired by Walden and Thoreau with their quotes on the wall. And it's the most used conference space in our community. It's used by the school districts. It's used by the Rape and Abuse Crisis Center. It's used by the accountants in our community. And we found that by giving the artists the platforms to create has been a huge uh, gift to our community. So think about your artists and how do you infuse them into your work. Um, another one is Fargo is home to the world's youngest international yo-yo champion. That's a big deal, right? So this is John Naram. He's on America's Got Talent. Um, we discovered him. This kid is amazing. And so at one of our healthcare events, we brought him in to do a piece. 
at our drone conference, we had him do a yo-yo piece that he choreographed before our US senator with kind of the planned words, you know, yo-yos, a senator, you know, you get that. Um, and, and what we find by bringing these creative folks in, it shifts the energy, it shifts the magic. At that same conference, we, uh, we brought this guy Greg in to do a piece, and, and Greg is part, um, he uses the pianos. Have you guys ever done the pianos around town where they take old pianos and they paint them and you spread them out? Well, we did that and Greg started using this piano and he played every day and we're like, we gotta bring him in to play. And so we brought him into our healthcare conference. He played in front of 400 people, one song, standing ovation. What's, what's amazing is that Greg currently lives in a tent in our community and, and he doesn't have a home. But we paid him a market wage to do what he loves. He's a busker in our community. He plays on the sidewalk. But nobody knew. And he wasn't there out of charity. He was there out of sharing his gift and his skill. And his confidence went up that day. And the conference was fantastic. So we have to think about where we can find these artists. Next thing we want to think about is building on your bright spots. I'm sure none of you have ever said, we want to be the next Fargo. Maybe you have. That would be awesome. Uh, but in Fargo, we hear a lot of folks say, we want to be Austin, Texas, or we want to be the next Silicon Valley. What do you all say? Do you have com communities you look up to? No? You don't have this? Okay. Well, that's awesome. Maybe it is Fargo. That would be huge. Um, but we say, we want to be the first Fargo. We don't want to be next to anything. We don't want to be a replacement. We don't want to copy anyone. We want to use our unique assets to be the best version of ourselves. And so we think about our local resources and what works. I think about sometimes folks want to um, you know, work on their weaknesses. I just believe in working on what you're good at and trying to get really, really good at it. Um, and so one of the things in this slide's a little hard to read is there's a program out at the Kauffman Foundation called One Million Cups. Have any of you ever heard of One Million Cups? OK, so let me break it down for those that don't. So the Kauffman Foundation is, is out of Kansas City, Missouri, and they're committed to powering entrepreneurs. And they had this thesis that if they brought their entrepreneurial community together, um, if they brought their entrepreneurial community together to have a million cups of coffee together, they could move ideas forward faster. And so they tried to convince us in Fargo to do this. And the model is you do a welcome, you give an entrepreneur six minutes to present their idea, the community asks 25 minutes of questions after, and that's it. And we're like, this idea is terrible. Like, we thought it would never work, so we're like, let's do it six weeks to prove it wouldn't work. You know, we tried it. And the crazy thing is it did work. So this is our second session, and to prove it wouldn't work, we did it in a blizzard, because we thought, okay, hey, the bad weather, then people won't come, then we don't have to do this. Um, but they did show up, and entrepreneurs started pitching their ideas, and the community came. So we're in, a, we're in an art museum here, and in the beginning it was 30 people. Then we had to move to our public library, because there's up to 100 people were coming within seven weeks. We also found out by bringing the guy that runs the craft brewery to come and he gives out free beer at 9 a.m. Like that's a good thing. That helps attendance. Uh, and now we average um, around 150 to 200 people every single Wednesday. We've had six planning meetings in the two and a half years we've been running One Million Cups. And it's the largest One Million Cups in the United States. There's 80 communities that do this. And this can happen in communities like Yankton, South Dakota, which is a community of 9,000 people, which actually has the largest one million cups in history. They got 700 people to go to a one million cups. They brought it to the high school that had 700 kids. They made everyone go, but hey, they still did it. Um, but we've done a couple things that have made our events special. One is we've been in a unique space. So we always do our events in art galleries or in, in theaters because when you bring it to the corporation, it just feels a little stiff. If you bring it to a university, people feel like, oh, I'm back in school. But when you bring it to a uni unique space, that's good. The other thing we did is that we found the best coffee in our community, and that's what we brought. We have the best coffee, and we had our United States Senator, John Hoven, there one day. He's like, wow, this is really good. Can I get a free refill? It's like, John, the coffee's free. Yes, like, that's OK. Um, but the other thing that's interesting is that coffee shop, we didn't ask them for discounted coffee. They were brand new. We actually said, because we had incredible sponsors, hey, let us buy your coffee up front, and let us pay a premium. We have the money. And I find it fascinating on how we treat new businesses in our communities. It's like they have, to, they have to cut their own teeth and they have to go through this hard way and it's got to be so painful. Why don't we as a community buy their products and spend premium, get them off the ground, and then when they're rocking and rolling, then ask them for help? So great coffee. And then the other thing we do is we do this random thing called random acts of art. 
And before our event, we'll bring in like an accordion player to play, or we'll bring in a theater group to perform before their big art opening. And we bring the arts into a technology event, and it creates energy and excitement. We also find if you bring kids programming in, you like triple your attendance, because they come and their parents come. It's like fantastic. So if you're like struggling on attendance, have kids programming come, and then your numbers go up. We think that's great. Um, but we figured out with One Million Cups, we put a ton of energy into making this the best we can because it's working. Rather than trying to keep things that aren't working alive, we, we, we focus on that bright spot. Um, another thing that we think about is drones. So North Dakota has a lot of drones, and it's a new technology uh, that's being utilized. And so um, we started a, a, monthly ga or a, week, yeah, a monthly gathering where we said, let's talk drones. And people are coming and sharing about the industry. And a friend said, hey, Greg, we have this hangar at the Fargo Jet Center, uh, would you be willing to throw a conference there? I was like, yeah, sure. He's like, okay, we have 30 days to do it. We're like, oh. So we put together a conference in 30 days. 140 people showed up last year. It was fantastic. We had speakers. This year we had it and 330 people spoke up. We got the head of NASA research to come and give a talk. We found large organizations and small. And in the middle of it, we put a student pitch contest. So drones are an emerging technology like, let's have a student contest. And students came from Syracuse. They came from the University of Nebraska. They came from uh, uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And a group of 19-year-olds from UNLV uh, shared their winning idea, which was using drones for search and rescue in remote places to help find missing children on camping trips. They beat the Syracuse PhD. And it was interesting that this got national attention. We got energy from all over the country. And now Fargo is known as a drone state. We'll be in Entrepreneur Magazine next month about the topic. But we just made it up. There was no strategic plan. All we did was hire a designer, got a good logo, started telling our friends, and then we like faked it. The first year out of the 140 people, like 30 of them paid for tickets. But this year, our second year, we got 300 people to pay for tickets. And we made $18,000. And I'm terrible at making money, so that was like a huge date. Um, but we just made it up, but it was our bright spot. There was energy and activity, and you can do this in artificial intelligence or blockchain or virtual reality. Whatever unique technologies are merging here, build an industry around it, have a conference, bring people in. It's a fantastic way to bring ideas to life. Uh, the last piece I want to talk about, uh, well, the second to last, is radical inclusivity. And I would say in North Dakota, this is the part we struggle most with. So for a lot of people, Diversity is exciting when we have the, the, the Lutherans and the Catholics talking together. Um, and, and, and I think in, in mid-America, this is really difficult. And this might be for you, it might not be, but I think about how do we approach radical inclusivity? So I think, for, first of all, about the arts and music. How do we think about introducing do, different musics to different generations? One of the things that we try to do is to juxtapose um, different people. So in the middle is a reggae artist, kind of a street performer named Diane, and this is at one of our events. And the, the guitarist on the life is the chief technology officer of the fastest growing company in Arizona. And they're doing a piece together. And it's not about ego in this moment. It isn't about their title. It isn't about how much money they have. It's getting them on the same team. The other thing that we think about is I got a call um, three years ago from a woman in, in, Vanco in Vancouver, Canada. And imagine you get this call. So just put it in your moment, mind for a moment. You're from North Dakota. Um, you're socially awkward. And this woman from Vancouver says, hey, Greg, my name's Jesse. Um, are you the guy that did TEDx Fargo? And I'm like, yeah. And she says, Greg, um, I, I run a conference called MisfitCon. And we're thinking of bringing 140 friends from around the world to Fargo to do an event. Would you help us? I'm like, tell me about the people. Like, well, one's a beekeeper, one's a technologist to build go-to meeting, one's a metal worker. Would you help us? And I had a moment. Do I help someone I've never met before that doesn't live in my country, that's bringing people from outside, or do I not? And I'm really glad I did because this group of folks, MisfitCon, came and they're artists and makers. And, and what was interesting is they've come to our community for three years. 10% of the audience is from Fargo, the rest is from all over the world. And what I've found is, is when we welcome people from outside our community into our communities, they become a mirror and they shine back the beautiful things. And I think so often, sometimes we take for granted what we have. Um, when I got here, Mark brought me down into Little Rock and I got to see the Clinton uh, Museum and this little f farmer's market and all this energy. Like, I think Little Rock is beautiful. 
And I'm not sure if everyone does, and maybe they do, but my guess is not everybody that's from here always sees it. So when we bring out-of-town friends in, they can help us find the hidden gems, the treasures. And so I think it's up to us to be inclusive when people move in. The other thing I wonder about is why is it that we always have parties um, when people retire? How many of you have been to a retirement party? Somebody's been there for like 35 years, and we say all these nice things. Why don't we have parties for when people move into our communities? Why don't we celebrate when people choose to call this place home? Why do we wait so long to celebrate them? Uh, we did a project in our community called Dinner Ties, where we're like, okay, so North Dakota specializes in being the 50th of 50 states for when people want to go to all the states, right? Like, that's fantastic. Like, we've got our niche. And we said, we want to invite the entire world to Fargo for dinner, so 7 billion people. So we're like, okay, how are we going to do it? So we created this program called Dinner Ties, where people coming through could go on a website and say, hey, I'm coming to dinner, and volunteers say, we'll host them in, in, in our homes. And we got 50 matches where people came to dinner, randoms, uh, people housed them, and, and gave them a, a free meal, kind of like an Airbnb model. And what we find by just being inclusive and saying people are welcome here, it sets the tone. When I moved back to Fargo after being gone for eight years, it took me one year to get invited to someone's home for a, for a home-cooked meal. And think about the young people in your community that are just moving there, whether they're teachers or doctors or coaches. How do we get them invited into our homes? It's easy to invite someone out for coffee and easy to invite them out for beer, but how do we do that? The last thing is how do we um, create welcoming environments? So one of the things our Economic Development Corporation does in Fargo that I think is fantastic is every quarter they have a welcome party. Anybody that has moved to Fargo within the last one, to ten, one day to 10 years can go, and, and we have this big party, and we celebrate the new people. What are you doing to celebrate the new people in your community, whether it's a new professor or whatever? Um, the other thing is, how do we be radically inclusive at who gets to speak at things? So um, in a one-day period at lunchtime, I sat on a panel talking to, uh, about entrepreneurship with our Chamber of Commerce, and there's like 200 people there, and I was like, how many of you are entrepreneurs? Not a single person raised their hand. I was pretty frustrated, it wasn't very exciting, and later that day I went to my grandma's senior care home and uh, I gave a talk to all of her senior citizen friends and they're like the nicest crowds because they're all smiling and laughing and then afterwards they're like, now what did you talk about? And then you tell them again. Um, but as I was leaving, I, this lady like ran, well, didn't run me down, she's in a wheelchair, but she tracked me down and she's like, you gotta meet my husband, Jim, and this is Jim. And uh, I was like, okay, cool, so Jim comes hobbling over and I'm like, hey Jim, what are you up to? And he's like, well, I got this e-commerce company and I'm selling magnets because I used to lose my cell phone and so I got a magnet on my cell phone, I got a magnet on my wallet and I can put them together. It's like fantastic, Jim. And so we invited him to speak at our One Million Cups. So the guy's 89 years old, right? He like hobbles up on stage and he starts talking. He tells about his ideas. In the question and answer session, people are like, so how did you get funding? And he goes, well, I tracked down Arthur Ventures and they don't invest in magnets, they invest in software. So he's like, that didn't work and none of these people would help. And he's like, and I sure as hell wasn't gonna sell my Apple stock. And I'm like, that's awesome, 89 year old dude keeping his Apple stock. Um, and then he said something interesting. He goes, my journey of starting a company over the last three years, two or three years, is what keeps me alive. I'm somebody that struggled with depression after I retired. And this has been my drug building a company, and I'm so much happier and healthier because I'm starting this business. And it made me realize I need to think that not all entrepreneurs have hoodies on, not all entrepreneurs are college kids, they are anywhere, and they are, they're doing interesting things. And the other thing I learned as Jim got that standing ovation and people are tearing up, it almost gave all of us permission that at any age and at any time we could start a company. And so when we're looking for talent, when we're looking for people to speak at things, sometimes it's not always good to have the person with the biggest title, but maybe it's the person from the most interesting place. And Jim gave me an amazing gift that day. I think as we think about community development, um, I think it all actually comes down to love. For me, my work is an expression of my love for my community. It's like a love letter. Um, I'm somebody that was laughed at for being from the place, and so I want to celebrate and lift up all the amazing people that call that same place home. And I find, so I believe in Jesus, and, and whether you believe in, in faith or not, um, we can all agree that Christianity is still here today. And the marketing of this whole movement has been love. And I think if we can love somebody enough, and love a place enough, it will, it will give us everything. 
And so in all of our work, we try to lead with love. We think about who are the community, people in our community that are struggling and who needs help. And like, there's a group of us that every year we draft a startup and we become their consultants, but they don't know it. And we do everything in our power to get them off the ground. But we never tell them. We just love them in that way. We think about how do we bring out the best in people? How do we make strong introductions? Um, I think all this is about love. And, and so I want to encourage you in your work to not think about, oh, how do you hit the strategic plan or how do you do all these things, but how do you love your community and love the people there? Um, so there's a couple things I want to challenge you to think about as we wrap up, and then I would love to take some questions. Is first is we all have to check our egos at the door. Um, I think if you, if you were to say, I'm going to start the largest taxi service in the world, and I'm not going to own a single car, you'd probably be like, you're crazy. But Uber did it. Or if you're like, I'm going to have the number one hotel system in the world, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have all these hotel rooms across the country, I'm going to become a billionaire in five years, you'd be like, Greg, you're an idiot. But Airbnb did it, right? So we have to check our ego of what works. And the thing I think about in this is I was a young person building a company and people would be like, hey, Greg, I just got to tell you, you got to think about this. Or do you have insurance? Or I don't think you should do it because this person's doing it and they might be upset. I think the world is good on devil's advocates. Like, I think we have plenty. And like, I'm so grateful for the people that take it upon themselves, tell you every reason why an idea won't work. But if we want our communities to thrive, we have to challenge ourselves to say to a person every why, reason why a community or an idea can work. And that's my hope for all of you is that you can check your ego, check the past at the door. Like, that's great. But the world is changing. And especially for millennials, they want to be told every reason why things can work. The next thing is, how do we remove barriers? I remember when we were getting TEDx off the ground, we were getting some press. Um, these people were like, Greg, it's so exciting what you're doing. Thank you. Can I, can I meet with you? I want to hear how I can help. I was like, oh, fantastic. And then they like start selling me insurance. Or they start trying to give me bank loans. Or they start trying to get me to do the fundraiser for the zoo. I'm like, I don't want to do the fundraiser for the zoo. I help, like code for sales is not help. Like, let's be real if you're gonna sell me something. And so I think we have to think about how do we remove barriers to get high performers off the ground? So if they need funding, I remember the mayor of Moorhead, Minnesota, and I really hope this talk is off the record and that video doesn't go anywhere. But the mayor was telling me, Greg, I met this amazing woman. She's starting a science academy for young girls. I'm like, that's fantastic. I was like, so how'd you help her? She's like, well, I went out and I got her a grant application. I'm like, oh, sweet. So you gave her paperwork. And like, that's terrible. Like, like, let's help people or write a check or find ways to share resources. But high performers need to have encouragement versus more things to do. The other thing about Remove Barriers, this photo is from an amazing thing. These folks got together and they just started writing positive reviews on Yelp and Google about their favorite places in our community. 30 people got together, we gave them free space, um, the bars and restaurants gave them free food, and they started writing positive reviews about our community. It made a difference, but nobody did it for money. Nobody did it because they were on the payroll. They just wanted to do this gift. Um, the other thing is collaborate, right? Like collaboration is not just about a, a co, like a bunch of signatures on a grant application. It's actually about doing real work together. And you probably get that. It's probably part of your life. Uh, another thing is design matters. How many of you have got a terrible free t-shirt in your life? <laughs> Did you wear it? No. So why do we spend the $4 on the bad free t-shirt versus like $8 on a beautifully designed, comfortable t-shirt that you want to wear into sleep at night, right? Like that's the goal. And so we find that all of our work design matters. And it's the invitations we send. It's the, it's the logos we build. Design really matters because that's the digital footprint that goes into our world. Um, the other thing is support the culture creators. And oftentimes I think about the misfits, you think about like Banksy and all these amazing artists. They maybe don't fit in. They maybe come to an event, they don't wear the right dress, they maybe don't have the money to be there, but how do we support the culture creators? And how do we not abuse that and take advantage of it? And so I want to challenge you to think about that. And the last thing is like earn media and social media matter. So in our community, we did this little hashtag called I love Fargo. And a group of friends just started tweeting with it, you know, whatever. It's got 9,000 impressions on Instagram, 5,000 on Twitter. That's more impressions than most marketing campaigns you spend way too much money with East Coast consultants on, right? And, and all it is is about getting that media. When I get a call from the local media saying, hey, Greg, I want to learn about Fargo and your tech community, 
I spend my entire day introducing them to people. I find that if a, if, if a journalist is interested in my community, if I can respond quickly and get them as much information as fast as I can, that's why we had a full page feature in Fortune, and that's why there's gonna be a big feature in Entrepreneur Magazine next month, and why Forbes likes us, because we help the media do their job faster. Um, in all of this, I've realized this is not our practice life. We only get one crack at it. And if we educate our cities, if we infuse the arts, we build on our bright spots, and, uh, and we practice radical inclusivity, leading with love, we can do incredible things. I'm a fifth generation North Dakotan. Um, I'm so proud of where I live because of people like you that, that were the ones that got up early in the morning and went to Rotary Clubs and sang those silly songs. Um, or you're the members of our churches that, that value people and support them. I, I want to keep encouraging you to keep going because this work does matter. It took me 20 years to realize the impact of my greatest inheritance of my life, which is relationships. It's the relationships I had in a rural community with my parents' friends that when my grandpa died, they were the ones there for me. And when our neighbor's house burned down, it was the organization around them um, is why that family got through the tough times. Our work does matter. And yeah, we may not be the tech capitals of the world, or we may not have the most artists per, per, uh, per city, but loving people really does matter. And that's why I think this work matters is that we all have it upon ourselves to create the communities we want to live in. And so thank you. That's what I got for you today. <laughs>